coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. I mean, I think people really need to be extremely demoralized and incapacitated in order to willingly and proactively just surrender their lives and their livelihoods and their reason for existing over to some invisible machines that flicker symbols on a screen. You know, the use case for really just kind of amputating the future and giving it to the machines is, as usual, like bad governments just forcing people to do these things and using their proxies in the private sector to force them to do it on, on pain of various penalties or being locked out of various privileges or, you know, not receiving patronage or being officially discriminated against or stigmatized. Hello, and welcome once again to The Roundtable, your weekly publishers and editors podcast here at The American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of The American Mind and associate editor of the Claremont Review of Books, and I've got a full house today. I am joined by editor James Poulos, managing editor Seth Barron, publisher and president Ryan Williams, and always a good day when we are joined also by Matthew Peterson, co-founder of New Founding, New Founder, co-founder of Founding, Founding New, co-founder, founder. Newfounding.com is where you can find that uh, <laughs> estimable organization. <laughs> it's all founding. It's founding, all founding, 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 founding co-founder, co New Founding. Well, let's start today by uh, talking about Georgia. We are, I guess, the recording this the day after the Georgia runoff election, which is now officially called for uh, Raphael Warnock over Herschel Walker went pretty late into the night. I was watching it and still hadn't gotten a convincing call. But then I think around 1030 or so it was it was settled. And that means that we are now at an actual honest to goodness majority for the Democrats in the Senate. This is the second time uh, that Republicans in a row, the Republicans have lost a significant Georgia runoff uh, th this time or last time, rather, Kelly Loeffler failed to beat Warnock. So we we're at 5149 in the Senate, and then we're at 222 to 213 technically, but actually 212 because of a death in the House. That's a GOP House and a Democrat Senate. We should, I think, discuss this from a number of different angles. One, you know, what's that? What's the difference going to be between that? And what we had before, which was a which was technically, I guess, you know, a, a tied Senate, but basically total Democrat control of, of Congress. This is a long last also the conclusion of the 2022 midterm elections. So we might consider the nature of our electoral system generally and how long it takes us to get a final answer on on things like this, although the vote itself for this particular runoff seems to have come in fairly, fairly quickly. We did have a number of, uh, you know, from my perspective, moderate sort of voting reforms in Georgia, which were naturally presented as the, you know, new Jim Crow, the end of all things. And Warnock himself, uh, in accepting his victory, said, you know, just because I won, don't think that we don't still have a problem with with voter suppression. It was just the people, you know, would insisted on their voices being being heard. I suspect that there would have been uh, something quite different going on had had Warnock, in fact, lost. But. Finally, the dimension of this we should discuss is the candidacy issue, uh, Herschel Walker, scandal ridden, and, you know, generally, I, I think probably not the ideal candidate even before all of this started coming out, but, you know, having the discovery that he seems to have possibly paid for the abortion of an illegitimate child, uh, this was kind of it wasn't it wasn't confirmed, but it was reinforced by uh, Walker's uh, son. Uh, Christian Walker, who's kind of a celebrity on online. And uh, there's been much discussion now of, well, you know, Brian Kemp won in Georgia. Was he, why wasn't he able to pull over these other guys across the line? What's the problem with Republican candidates? Um, what's the Trump of it all? And so I will, I think, just leave it at that and hand it over to you guys. I mean, this is not a totally shocking result to me, but it does start to crystallize a few 
uh, pictures. Is there anything that we can gain out of this that would, might be helpful for us going forward? What was the margin? What did the margin end up being? Do we know? I didn't look. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very looking close. at 51.4% very, very for Warnock, 48.6 oh. for Walker. So, but that's a, yeah, so it's a matter of it'll probably be about uh, hundreds. But, yeah. <clears throat> when it's all said and done. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I figured Walker was toast as soon as the balance in the Senate didn't hang on Georgia slash Fulton County. So, I mean, the enthusiasm kind of drained completely out of that race as soon as it didn't matter. And it's just hard, you know, especially low information voters. And I mean that you know, in the best sense, <laughs> people getting on with their normal lives, you know, to the, to them, the, the like jujitsu 3d chess of having mansion be more important because your margin is fist still 50, 50 is just lost on everyone. So that would not be, that wouldn't have been enough to resurrect any enthusiasm. So I, I just anecdotally, I confirmed what I had the sense of, which is that as soon as, as soon as, yeah, the Senate wasn't a balance, wasn't in the balance. It was going to be tough for Herschel Walker, a flawed candidate in so many ways. Uh, I'll add on top of your many items that he's just not that bright. He's not a great communicator. You know, he prob we should say on the Trump thing, he probably would have won that primary regardless of the Trump endorsement. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I I'm not that surprised. I just figured this is what the result would be, especially after the results of the midterms. I'm kind of thinking, um... You know, maybe this is like, maybe I've taken the McConnell pill, <laughs> but, um, is it a turtle shaped pill? So. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, um, it, it's like, is a divided government really so bad from a conservative's point of view? I mean, isn't gridlock kind of ideal? I mean, if we had won the Senate, what would we have done with it? Uh, we, you know, we'd have to, that's also we, the McConnell pill. <laughs> right. And like, well, if, if we wouldn't have like, you know, o overwhelming veto proof legislation, I imagine it would just be like typical sort of neoliberal stuff and more aid to Ukraine and, and anything Biden would happily sign. Um, and then in 24, they could just run against a, a solid Republican Congress. Um, I mean, doesn't a conservative kind of want government not to do anything? <laughs> this is just my kind of like, you know, I'm being a little contrarian. Yeah, sure. But, uh, you, know, for, you know, for the purposes of, uh, of argument. I mean, is this really the worst thing that could happen? Not the worst. The worst would have been not winning the House either. You know, I, I would just, the asterisk I would drop, and this is the third part of the McConnell pill, uh, is that if it had been a narrow GOP majority, you could have stopped bad nominees and bad judges from the Biden administration. So that, that's, uh, that's right. really the only thing I can say for it. Because look, look at our establishment now, which is still firmly in control of the Senate with McConnell as its leader. It's busy about the business of basically failing to deliver, undermining or selling out uh, the concerns of the base of the Republican Party that are now 40 years old. So that was going to continue. Uh, let's see what value do I have to add here. Um, I mean, I I knew we were facing doom when uh, when Herschel's vampire video started to make the rounds. We should not make light of praise for vampires. They are not cool. They are part of the problem. The uh, the energy of the soul must not be substituted by uh, artificial bloodsuckers hoping to feed off of the last remnants of real life in order to uh, extend their own lives unnaturally and cover up the uh, the horror of it all with a a thin and uh, and transparent sheen of fabulousness which does not hold up to closer inspection so that was that was a real fail for me um i mean you know this is sort of like two uh heretics enter one mm -hmm. can leave and uh and warnock you know definitely the more heretical of the two i mean some of the the messaging that came out of that guy and out of the campaign and his surrogate just absolutely jaw droppingly like inappropriate uh, 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 appropriation, if not expropriation of uh, of Christianity and, and its and its symbols in the service of vote grubbing. I mean, it really just sort of horrendous stuff. Um, I 
it, it, it burdens my heart that this guy is going to be uh, sitting there in the Senate for God knows how long. And it speaks to, uh, you know, to a real problem. Candidate quality is a phrase that was bandied around for a while. And, you know, is Herschel Walker a bad candidate? Well, I mean, obviously not good enough. But we have to ask ourselves, you know, like, is it possible to run normie candidates and win anymore? I, I hope so. Uh, there's still a lot of normies. Um, and I think the, the big question looming over all of this, looming like a vampire, if you will, is what the normies are going to do um, over the next couple of years, whether they are going to um, gravitate to whoever is, is, is not Donald Trump or whether they are uh, going to kind of be too intimidated or too over it or too interested in grilling to, uh, to really be a factor. Um, I think, uh, you know, between the, uh, the based and the, uh, the not so based, I'll use clean language on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of normies and, uh, and we may, you know, we, we may be, uh, in a, in a state of growing dependence on those normies. So if you don't put up normie candidates, uh, can you really get normie votes? A lot of people went for, for Warnock and it, you know sort of beggars the imagination that that normies would do that but it seems that some did and uh you know i, I think whichever uh whichever candidate or or would be candidate over the next year or so finds a way of um you know not just appealing to normies but stiffening their spines i think youngkin kind of did that a little bit but youngkin is probably you know, contrary to what you'll hear from the not so based quarters of the internet probably not a model uh, of the, the kind of candidate that is going to uh, really assume a, a strong leadership position in the GOP. So, you know, we're still waiting for that sort of uh, that Chad Normie to appear. And, uh, and I hope that uh, that person appears soon. I just want to put a like asterisk to that point, which is that I think Warnock is very skilled at something which is becoming increasingly a Democrat playbook tactic, which is to wear a normie suit. I mean, that was the Biden situation. And, you know, as you say, James, like, I support abortion, because it's what Jesus would do. I'm, you know, the uh, voting is a kind of prayer, all of these things are kind of appalling. But the guy is a reverend in the in a Baptist church. And, you know, I've heard him his name floated as like a potential presidential candidate, because he's looks so, you know, moderate and clean. So all of that to say, you know, we we could do that in a good way, you know, like we could have people that were presentable and, and uh, eloquent, but had, I think, sort of more firm conservative beliefs. But at the very least, we, yeah, we ought to run people that can appeal and make sense outside of like the Twitter sphere. I had to drop one footnote. I know Matt wants to get in here, but uh, our, as our friend and former fellow Nate Hawkman writes in National Review, one of the few good people to read at National Review, Nate Hawkman, mm -hmm. there are a couple others. You know, obviously it was a candidate quality problem. He's Herschel Walker's the only person to, uh, the only Republican to lose a statewide race in Georgia this cycle. So that, you know, come on, let's not make this harder than it is. Yeah, I don't have much to say, much to add. <laughs> I'm not going to, I mean, I accept for the fact the whole thing is just, kind of boring at this point. Like to me, it's, it's, it's really hard to get excited one way or another. Uh, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's right. I don't know. But I will say one good thing about, um herschel which is what an incredible athlete he was <laughs> and i remember writing uh, a radio story about him and it was like a short you know bio and he just latched on at some point he was like a fat kid and he latched on to uh what his coach said almost autistically and the coach said you gotta get in shape so you gotta do these three things and it was something like you know run and do push-ups or something like that do push-ups and sit-ups and run or something along these lines and then he said he just started he just started doing that during commercials when he was watching TV instead of doing his homework. And and the guy just became this. Right. I mean, it, his athleticism, as they say, it was sick. It was out of control. The guy was incredibly in shape. And then, uh, you know, not only had multi you know sport career could have gone in different directions, but also did the MMA thing right later on in life and kick some ass at that, too. Um, really? but, um, this is a total, yes, a total yeah, he was, he, he was like, yeah, he was like in his forties, I think. Um, and he whooped some ass for a few fights 
I believe this is all part of Herschel's story about the best side of Herschel Walker, which wouldn't have much to do in my mind with probably running for office. But um, we'll say that about him. He's an interesting guy that way. It's just really bizarre. Like, uh, you know, when he's just one of these crazy, uh, crazy athletes, like, uh, like Bo Jackson or something like that. On the whole thing, though, I, there is this uh, one more thing. Georgia is is like this weird now end game place, like where the McConnell pill <laughs> uh, is given out from, distributed from, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I I kind of with Seth, like I I don't even I don't even know if I care. I don't know why I care. Why do I care about this stuff anymore? They're they're losers at the na- national level. It's just really hard to get uh, to get excited about it. And I kind of felt that way last time, too. I mean, yeah, it was really, really important holding the Senate. But there was just something about the the way in which the politics is unfolding now that's just really hard to get exercised because it's so corrupt and uh, and colorless. I agree with that. I think there's definitely something there's a sense that the, the urgent things and the immediate things are much more are much deeper than politics for, for most people. I mean, everybody's got their calling and maybe your you know, part in this is to be involved in, in politics. But for a lot of us uh, on the ground, the kind of immediate questions have much more to do with, you know, spiritual matters directly uh, surrounding us. And so to that end, in fact, uh, let's turn to this question, which to me is sort of more interesting of artificial intelligence. <laughs> artificial intelligence is having a bit of a moment, as they say. Uh, and I'm sure James will explain why this moment is, uh, you know, is is our eternal moment and has been a long time in coming and, and so forth. But, you know, if you're just sort of scrolling around on the Internet, you may have seen these incredibly flattering sort of cartoon looking, comic book looking profile pictures and recreations of people's photographs that are catching on, going viral. We've seen a lot of them lately. They tend to be extremely flattering. Um, And what this is, if you are wondering about that, is an app called Lensa, Lensa AI, which you can download and basically you feed it a bunch of your pictures and it goes away and constructs this image of you um, out of what it's able to discern, you know, or rather, that's probably the wrong verb, what what its um, sensors can detect, let's say, as the structure of your face, the shape of your body, and so forth. Uh, they're quite remarkable. They're certainly better than any of the other ones that I've seen. Um, Seth used to text me all these dolly things that he would create, which it was a, a different thing from OpenAI, where, they, where you could, like, tell it to create something, and it would make a kind of warped and somewhat satanic and terrifying picture of that thing. Um, But in fact, OpenAI plays into this segment in this story as well, because this is a, in fact, originally an Elon Musk investment project, along with others, Musk and Sam Altman and and a bunch of others uh, invested over $1 billion or pledged over $1 billion into this uh, institute called OpenAI, which has launched a bunch of projects, including DAL-E, but now including, as of this November, chat. GPT. Um, and GPT, it t- took me a while, I'm embarrassed to say, to figure out what GPT stands for. Um, but it turns out it stands for GUID partition table. So there's another acronym involved. Partition table is a kind of, as I understand it, very sketchily, it's a mode of uh, categorizing and organizing data and files. Um, the typical one is called an MBR. The GPT is kind of a new one. And then a GUID is a global, uh, unique identification number or, or uh, mechanism. So this is a way of organizing things according to their global unique uh, ID. And the reason any of that matters is because when you have this hyper-powerful mode of organizing information, you can do something we've talked about before on the show, which is feed a ton of text, human-produced text, most of it, to a program and tell that program to learn the patterns. Again, learn may be the wrong verb um, to incorporate the patterns into its own programming, which then will spit out for you if you ask it a question, text that increasingly starts to sound like somebody is on the other line. So that's also been a fun, maybe, internet game. I feel in all of these things, like everybody is sharing them with a mixture of sort of nervous laughter, haha, isn't this fun, quickly careening into sort of horrified uh, shrieking (laughs) because, you know, people have been doing stuff like creating workarounds to take down some of the boundaries on what this thing can say and you know coaxing it 
it seems, uh, I haven't been able to confirm whether it will actually do this, but coaxing it into uh, outlining its plans for the destruction of humanity. I tried to get in there uh, and ask, do you have a soul? But it's the traffic is so heavy right now that I couldn't I couldn't get in. Um, in any case, listeners, longtime listeners will remember that we talked about that question with Google's uh, version of this program that was it came into the news briefly because one of its engineers became convinced that it was alive. And we talked before about you know, <laughs> why that's not what's actually going on. Um, and it becomes increasingly relevant because what's interesting, at least to me, is that both of these programs are programs for taking in a bunch of data, a bunch of stuff. And then performing transformations upon it until the exterior surface of it looks like what a person might, under certain circumstances, do. The major difference being that, you know, and people have stressed this, that it, the machine is not having anything like the kind of experience that you are being tricked into imputing to it. It's not looking at your picture. It's not reading your text. It's not even uh, comprehending and answering your question uh, by any stretch of the imagination so much as it is, you know, mimicking basically the behavior of somebody who would be doing those things. Um, in the meantime, as everybody is uh, gently flirting with the possibility that these machines might do, pull a, um, you know, pull a science fiction and obliterate us all, San Francisco, of all places, voted into effect uh, briefly and then walked back the possibility of doing of, of equipping police with robots that don't have guns but do have explosives and could kill this was, it was met with public outcry and, and was rescinded but it certainly raised the specter of the possibility that a kind of boston dynamics uh exploding robot might be coming soon to a domestic disturbance near you all of this to say I'm sure that everybody is now just kind of wound up and raring to to talk about this. So I maybe I'll just uh, leave it at that. What do we make of uh, the rise of the machines? I sort of oh. feel like Matt on this one where he's just like so over it. I had some people uh, ask the bot to uh, review Human Forever. Um, I got two uh, pretty favorable reviews back, um, <laughs> neither of which evinced uh, any real familiarity with the book totally uh, ignorant of the uh, political theory and the uh, the political theology to be found therein. I saw uh, somebody else post a sort of long conversation, quote unquote conversation with the bot uh, on the topic of, of us human beings. Um, the bot did not view us very fa favorably, went into uh, pretty sophisticated detail about how uh, the cancer that is the human race uh, could and would be wiped off the face of the earth by uh, the bots. And, uh, you know, my reaction to this was like, I guess it's time to ask the bot what uh, what the bot thinks of, of you know, like God, um, which no one seems seems to have done yet. Um, it is it is clear that uh, technology of this uh, power and of this apparent power raises ultimate questions about who and why we are and why we should bother carrying on as as who we are and so it seems that uh you know it might might be important for those machines to be trained in matters that apply to those kinds of ultimate questions and yet no so uh you know the uh the wokies uh come in for a lot of criticism of course lots of it justified but uh they seem to understand the stakes uh insofar as they're scrambling to create a new religion in order to assert some control over the technology and to see the the right broadly speaking just so absolutely flat-footed on these issues is is a bummer it is unfortunate the you know the potential silver lining is that well it's green field you know we can start fresh there's just a blank page like a world of possibility so uh so maybe we can we can ramp up more quickly than if uh, we were carrying around a lot of baggage. But again, like there is actually a lot of baggage um, in, in a world where, you know, you've got these Warnocks and these walkers uh, stumbling around uttering things that theologically are just not going to be good enough for uh, training the bots not to kill us all. Uh, it makes you wonder, um, you know, is it is it really down to the likes of us to sort of step up to the microphone in the dead silence and uh, and start uh, presuming to tell people what to do. Maybe so.
Maybe so. The the bots certainly have not convinced me otherwise. It, well, just real quick, I got on there and I did ask. The first thing I asked was, I said, "Is Jesus Christ the Son of God?" Uh, <laughs> and and the answer was, you know, like Christianity definitely maintains that, you know, that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, and then I asked, uh, uh, "Do you worship God?" And and it, then it broke. <laughs> Maybe it was just uh, bad timing. And then I didn't yeah. have time to do anything else. But, but doesn't that question break everybody? I mean, those are, yeah. like, I, I get, yeah, I get sure. that it's, it's kind of like these are questions, like these asking if the big questions will kind of, you know, demonstrate its failure at the limits. But how about just like regular questions? Like, can you please, you know, create a program that will like, you know, do some specific function? Or can you copy edit this article? Or can you write an article about Warnock? I mean, these kind of more, yeah, okay, these aren't maybe questions that, you know, pose an existential crisis for the nature of man, but they certainly pose a uh, organizational crisis for, like, you know, the workplace and the future of, like, what humans should do. I mean, if I mean, if in fact they can, like, you know, have these things, you know, doing all the legal briefs and all the op eds and making movies and writing code. I mean, this could be the self driving cars problem, like, actuated, right? Like, actually putting millions of people out of work. You know, which then actually is like an existential crisis of its own, of its own, without even getting into the, the like the kind of Turing test questions of like, what is consciousness? Yeah, I mean, I think people really need to be extremely demoralized and incapacitated in order to willingly and proactively just surrender their lives and their livelihoods and their reason for existing over to some invisible machines that flicker symbols on a screen. You know, the use case for really just kind of amputating the future and giving it to the machines is, as usual, like bad governments just forcing people to do these things and using their proxies in the private sector to force them to do it on, on pain of various penalties or being locked out of various privileges or, you know, not receiving patronage or being officially discriminated against or stigmatized. You know, in that respect, like we've seen this story before, none of this should be that surprising. Bad governments do these kinds of things, regardless of what technology they have at their disposal. Um, and that's why, you know, that's why we still talk about justice around here. Wasn't there um, an Isaac Asimov short story about they they crossed this singularity, they had supercomputers, and they wanted to figure out the beginning of the universe? Am I remembering this correctly, Spencer, or anyone? Anyway, so we're, uh... we're checking out. Uh, yeah, I may have the author. I think it's an Asimov short story, but uh, anyway, go go find it. Yeah, I'm, it leads me to also wonder. Um, and I, I may this this may be just a matter of ignorance, and maybe it's out there already. But it seems to me it's a it would be a good thing for various large state governors and or uh, the president or you know the high end of academia in the best sense to start putting together councils on digital ethics, <laughs> like the, uh, the old George W. Bush Council on Bioethics. The great story I, I love from that one is Leon Cass chaired it, who is a political philosophy professor at Chicago of long, long standing. And uh, he uh, had some assigned reading to this council. And of course, the Council on Bioethics was a mix of humanities, social scientists, and then hard scientist types. And he made them all read uh, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne is it Hawthorne's The Birthmark. Uh, this short story about this with a great scientist of his age who had this beautiful, charming wife, and she was perfect in every way except she had this this uh, birthmark on her cheek, and he had convinced her she she was devoted to him, a student of his of sorts, uh, and also his his wife, and she was completely devoted to him, and she she said yes. Well, if you if you can make me absolutely perfect and remove the birthmark, sure, why not try it. And the tale is of sort of descent into him trying harder and harder and harder and failing and failing and failing to get rid of this birthmark until he destroys her and kills her in the process. And all the, all the hard scientists on the committee, this is sort of, it was in reporting years back, I forget who mentioned this, but uh, it may be even, even have been Leon Cass. But the hard scientists on the council were, were 
kind of aghast, appalled, and and insulted that they had to read some you know crappy humanities thing, mm -hmm. and they they weren't sure what the, the what the hell this had to do with bioethics and the leading leading edge of science. So it seems like um, smart people should be uh, thinking this way about these topics as well, and I hope they are, but probably not enough of them. Yeah, let's just, I mean, let's stipulate for the record that to, to Ryan's point, the, the problem is that, uh, you mean, there's, there's tons of people who are rushing to be AI, you know, ethic, yeah. uh, ethics leaders. And the problem is most of them are just awful. It's, you know, yeah. it'll be like some on a Rawlsian basis, we will blah, blah, blah. It's all boring and it's all terrible. And ultimately, it's the kind of thing where, like, the problem with normal bioethics, right? Unlike that council, is they just you, the people you pay to tell you that what you're doing is a okay, and that's kind of their role in a technocratic society. But the the real underlying questions here, and also gaming out what is the result of this, and what's going to happen, and what are the dangers, just requires deeper thought. And I think, you know, padding. Claremont on the back, right? I mean, at least at, like, no one can say Claremont hasn't been trying and some of the stuff James has been doing and others. I mean, it, the problem is that our people just don't think about this stuff and don't take it seriously and traditionally have not. Whereas the left was much more about materialism and material, you know, material things causing stuff. And it, and it, it's just a weird, it's a weird, it didn't have to be this way, but we just don't have people thinking deeply enough. And now all of a sudden, you know, it's all here. And then that's why James is, is frustrated, just saying, like, I, 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 why, why should I even repeat myself on this stuff? Uh, and, and I mean, I, I, I also think that the initial reactions, right, that our extremes are always a problem, Like right? The initial reactions either like this is super awesome or this is all terrible and we should burn all these machines. Uh, and, you know, that's just laziness. I mean, sometimes one of those one of those things is right, it's just laziness because it's not the kind of thing the right focus is on. The only positive thing I can say is um, is someone did send me not in this iteration, not the chat, but the 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 uh, I forget even what it's called, but the longer right, the longer essays, the thing that's going to destroy schools and writing. And someone put in and this was astounding to me. Can, like can write an essay about Matthew J. Peterson's understanding of the common good and the founding mm -hmm. versus Patrick Deneen's. And they, you know, they had to like tweak it a little bit or press the button like a monkey a few times. And in the essay, I thought it was great. I mean, it said I was right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, but what was crazy about it is of course I have not unlike, <coughs> uh, you know, Patrick Deneen, who I, I actually like, uh, even if I disagree with him on some things, he, he he has written a ton on this, right? He's all over the place. They must have picked up my dissertation and maybe two or three, like, you know, not even scholarly articles. Yeah. Because uh, no one was going to pay me to write scholarly articles back in the day. So so I, it was able to, you know, put that together in a way that was astounding. And that was, I don't know, when was that? Last year. And, and uh, the more and more you see of it, you know, we, we need more people out there on the cutting edge looking at this because, you know, there also are thoughtful people within technology talking about this stuff. Uh, but but then you get to James's point, they don't have the deep, deep, you know, philosophy or theology that's that's traditional. And the fact is, that's just a rare thing. And so, you know, I mean, I, I really do think it's it's important for people to be thinking about this in, in the way that James has been pushing. And it's like, OK, and if no one does it, it's just going to be forced upon us and you're going to get these earth shattering changes that Seth's talking about. So Christmas is a coming, and therefore I feel doubly okay bringing up this Charles Dickens story, which is not a Christmas carol, but another Christmas story from 1848, The Haunted Man or the Ghost's Bargain. And in the kind of like B-side Dickens Christmas, this guy who has a, you know, a, a terrible recollection of grief every Christmas is visited by a ghost. And the ghost says, I'll, I'll erase your memory of your pain. And of course, he takes it because he thinks, well, then I won't have to hurt anymore. But what he discovers is just that he it, it is still miserable. He just doesn't know why. 
<laughs> and it's kind of amazing because, you know, you talk to people now who are medicated, uh, you know, halfway to kingdom come by their psychiatrists and they'll say something very similar. I'm still sad. I just, you know, I can't feel it anymore. Or I'm kind of like numbed and anesthetized. And, you know, these questions about what is human, what makes us human, what's valuable about us, what's redemptive in our pain, shouldn't we just kind of wash them, wash our pain away and wouldn't, wouldn't things be better if we could you know, minutely kind of artificialize every aspect of our experience, like very, very old, older than Dickens, certainly. And, uh, you know, if you're shocked that he's able to encapsulate some aspect of something so modern in, uh, you know, a story from 1848, then like, you know, maybe, maybe you haven't thought hard enough about the stuff that James is, is discussing, right? These ideas, like what if we could create a, you know, an artificial world that perfectly answered to our desires, like, <laughs> they raise very profound questions about what we are, what's our good, what's the the value of us vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of, of entities. And yeah, like one of the problems is, of course, that it seems as if people, you know, would perhaps rather live in a world where the internal experience, the qualia, the thing that you that you feel when you look at something or when you have a, a perception of the outside world, where that is, you know, increasingly erased or or rendered irrelevant, because then maybe you won't feel any pain anymore. I mean, not for nothing, but it does seem as if for a long time before this became a thing, we've already thought of ourselves as if we were essentially machines. So it makes perfect sense that we would consider ourselves replaceable by machines and discover that, you know, actually our machines do everything better than us that we do, right? Like if we are just chemistry sets inside of meat sacks, whose whole being, not just our bodies, but our everything that we are obeys the same laws of physics and nature that you know a stone obeys and it falls to the ground then really like what is the point of us besides besides just being giving birth to the homo deus to the new like machinery that's going to surpass even even our quote-unquote operating system so yeah like you know we've set ourselves up into a position where we think of course that like all the good stuff that we love is going to now just be maximized by these machines that do things better than us. But, you know, we, we have no sense of where those, the, the true verities and excellences, like the virtues actually live in us. They don't live in the parts of us that look analogous to a line of code. They look, they live in the parts of us that could never, you know, that aren't even being approximated. Like what, one thing we don't seem to understand is that we're not like making steps toward humanity by making machines that imitate humanity better and better. Like it's a complete category disjunction. We, the, the humanity is a completely other kind of thing. And yeah, like it's some of the things, as Matt says, some of the things that we currently spend our time doing um, might in fact be well outsourced to machines. That's happened before, you know, the car is not like an evil invention and it's not impossible. I'm not even like totally anti self-driving car. I think there are like difficulties and questions around it, but like, the real question becomes not like, what are the parts of us that we can conceivably outsource, but rather what are the parts of us that not only we can we never outsource, but we're not even coming close to outsourcing. And if we abandon them, if we don't do them, nobody will do them. Glorifying God, for instance, there's something that if, if you know, if humanity does not do that, that then on this earth, no one, no, no one and nothing will except, you know, involuntarily after the manner of, of natural creation. So yeah, these, these kinds of things like uh, to say the least, are not first and foremost top of mind for the people that are writing the like ethics software for these things. Yeah, people like getting lost. Uh, people like wandering off. People like walking away from their their responsibilities and uh, and uh, refusing to take uh, their their duties seriously. And uh, you know the the main way in which we can do that and feel good about it is by is by putting reason and imagination into this kind of sadomasochistic feedback loop uh you know like pure reason says we can build these these tools these machines out of inanimate matter and alone you know that's kind of horrifying and kind of boring and it's just kind of like dedicating yourself to building lamps that can take over the world through the the sheer force of their their quantity and their their repetitive ability and then uh, imagination comes along and goes, well, you know, but but then we can apply all this kind of like human magic, this, you know, the the twinkle in your eye that makes you say like, but what if? And like, you know, we can imbue it with these characteristics and we can fantasize over these machines and then they become something better than this, these dead works that they would otherwise be. 
yet at the same time, you know, the, the number of idle fantasies that you can have that distract you away from uh, the basics about uh, who you really are, those, those will be very limited unless you keep building these machines that are there to be the kind of the, the raw material for, for, uh, for endless imaginations to be, to be uh, fabricated by and played out on. So, you know, it's this reinforcing loop of sorts. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's never really capable of generating real life. I think that's kind of where the rubber hits the road on, on this for me is, uh, you know, you can manufacture these robots, you can manufacture human fantasies, you can slap the two together and make them dance in ways that always seem novel and always seem different. But really, it's just a recursive loop. And uh, human beings have been tempted to worship the Uroboros for a very long time, very primal, very primitive cosmic symbol. It's, it's hard to get rid of these things. It's the work of centuries. And uh, it looks like we're going to have another work of centuries to, uh, to engage in, unless, of course, too many people decide to end it all. <laughs> Not for nothing, but the primal description of idolatry in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, so going back, you know, deep, deep into BC territory is that you form human looking entity out of some raw material, then you attribute to that entity's sensory organs, the kind of internal experience and perceptive faculties that you yourself know and have as being in the image of God. And the next thing that happens is that since the eyes of the idol really, in fact, cannot see and the mouth of the idol cannot indeed speak, then your eyes become blinded and your ears uh, become heavy. So the loop that James is talking about uh, is very old. All right. Um, uh, Spencer, just quickly for, yeah. the, for those interested, uh, speaking of machines, I Googled the yes. Asimov. It was an Asimov story called The Last Question, ah. which, which he at one point said, this is uh, by far, sorry, it's, uh, this is by far my favorite story of all those I've written. It's an interesting thing, can be read quickly but it t touches on some of these themes, uh, eternal as they are. I just want to flag for our amusement and contemplation. I now recall a conversation that Matt, Matt and I had at the, um, the Sheriff's Fellowship, and we were talking about smartphones and Matt's analogy, which I think he'd gotten from a priest friend or somebody at some point, which uh, really stuck with me. He's like, imagine you're in a medieval household and there was like a box in, in one room. And if you open that box, especially if your children open that box, all sorts of horrible things were revealed to them. It warped their minds and turned them against you. You would destroy that box as some sort of portal to hell. Uh, and we were talking about pornography and teenagers and TikTok and gender dysphoria and smartphones. And our conclusion was that the smartphone is a portal to hell. This AI chatbot may be another. <laughs> Don't give it to your kids. Okay, let's talk about the Twitter files. And really, you know, we can continue our talk about tech as we are discussing this. Because really, we're just talking about a technical or rather a political dimension of this of this tech discussion. So we've already talked at some length about Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter. This was one of his latest, I think, uh, acts of, of showmanship, but also of reform, which is that he gave some internal documents to some journalists, most notably Matt Taibbi, but also Barry Weiss. Um, and Taibbi, you know, a lefty, but kind of in the, you know, a, a dissident from, from wokeness, not, uh, not sympathetic to wokeness and, you know, hungry for a story as any good reporter should be, uh, unlike many of the people that pass for reporters currently. And he tweeted out this thread called the Twitter files, uh, December 2nd, 2022. Uh, many people remarked that this was kind of a difficult thread to uh, really follow for a number of reasons. So a shout out to our buddy, Mike Solana, who put it up on his Substack Pirate Wires. You can kind of read it as a document there as well, if you're interested. Who, what are some things that are revealed in here? I mean, one, one thing that does seem to be the case is we're getting out of this more sort of confirmation of what we already knew and suspected than a kind of smoking gun or explosive revelation. The main thrust of the whole piece has to do with the Hunter Biden laptop story, which I'm sure none of our listeners need me to remind them, was suppressed on Twitter in the lead up to the 2020 election. It was so suppressed, so thoroughly smothered that you couldn't share it on DMs for a while. And so 
one kind of in question that Musk wanted to investigate when he got, you know, the keys to the car and that he wanted Taibi to go into was like, how did this happen? Did the government have a role to play in it? What exactly went down during those crucial moments? Because, you know, whether or not you think this was this through the election, it certainly had an effect on it. And it is indicative of the kind of thing that could throw an election at the very least. So it turns out that what Taibi has to offer us is, first of all, there is there are lines of communication between, for example, the Biden campaign and uh, the high higher ups at Twitter. And since Twitter employees tend to skew very left, there evolved a real kind of symbiotic relationship uh, back and forth between the, you know, uh, the Biden people and the Twitter people to the point that you were they were getting emails like, well, you just kind of delete these accounts or delete these tweets because they're giving us trouble. And the answer would be like, yeah, on it, totally. So there is a kind of insidious collusion going on between, um, you know, government entities and the uh, higher ups at Twitter or even just the basic operating system at Twitter. There is not in this thread any evidence of direct intervention by the government to suppress the Hunter Biden's laptop story. What happened is that the FBI, as we know from Facebook and from, you know, other kind of revelations, the uh, FBI had issued a kind of general warning about uh, Russian hacking in the lead up to the election, which is one of the things that was supposedly involved in 2016. Um, although that too is, a, you know, a shaky claim to say the least. In any case, the sole reason for suppressing the story seems to have been, or the sole, sole expressed reason seems to have been, uh, we were worried it might have been Russian hacking. There's no evidence of that. This is something that was just kind of undertaken by this, we already know, quite, you know, ideologically skewed, biased uh, group of higher ups at Twitter. So, you know, I've said I've made this reference before on this show, but what we have here is a will nobody rid me of this meddlesome priest situation. You know, these these entities which have become effectively our digital public square are also, you know, incentivized and so structured as to respond very sensitively to even the merest suggestion um, or not even the merest suggestion, but the inclination that something might be bad for Democrats, that it you know might it, it, it inclined at least to equate things that are bad for Democrats with uh, malinformation, misinformation, and, and Russian um, disinformation. So I would say that we're not getting out of this anything that we didn't know already. But on the other hand, we're certainly getting uh, a lot that confirms what we you know, felt very, very deeply. And, you know, I wonder what you guys make of this. I'm particularly interested in this mode of reporting because I, I suspect that Musk here is kind of beta testing something that he hopes to do more of and he hopes other people will do more of since the legacy press reaction to this revelation, these revelations or this, this story has been either radio silence or condemnation of Musk and Taibi for raising the information. This is dangerous. You know, you shouldn't be talking about this, which when this Biden, Hunter Biden uh, investigation is still ongoing, strikes me as a shocking attitude uh, position for the press to take, except that maybe I just shouldn't be shocked. You, you forget, Spencer, the other mode of the other piece of the reaction, which is to dismiss it. Uh, right. It's not a big deal. Yeah. As, uh, oh, you know, and in sort of coordinated fashion, right? So this is, this is one of the virtues of Twitter and all of the journalism being on Twitter is that you can see the the talking points have kind of gone out and they're all saying similar things, which is to say, this is a non-story. Basically, uh, yes, Twitter should have taken down uh, some guy's dick pics, uh, which is what, <laughs> what Hunter Biden's <laughs> laptop contained. And w why is Taibi, why is the formerly brave journalist, uh, dissident journalist Taibi doing the, the um, sort of skunk work or uh or ha hatchet work of uh, a billionaire it's all shameful we shouldn't all be paying attention yeah it's uh it's, well we'll see uh, musk is now saying that another uh, episode two uh, speaking of your discussion of the kind of reporting that that uh, musk is doing on twitter through taibi i suspect if he was smart he's doing what any of us would do when we've seen stories like that like this be successful in recent years, which is to say, you release the most benign stuff first, let everyone dismiss it, and then you just escalate. 
you know, in drums mm -hmm. and drabs over the course of days and, and then embarrass everyone with a much bigger story. So we'll see. Well, it's so insane. I mean, this fellow Jim Baker, who I guess was in the FBI, a big lawyer at the FBI, the one who concocted all of this um, the story about uh, a Russian bank having direct ties to Trump organization servers and, you know, basically giving stuff from the Hillary camp, feeding Hillary campaign info to the FBI back and forth. He was in charge of vetting the files. I mean, it really just indicates that, I mean, the deep state, it's not even that deep. I mean, it's just on top of, it's it's like the 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 first layer. It's, um, you know, the DNC working with any of its candidates and the FBI and private media. You know, one thing that's interesting is when all of this came out and Trump said, like, this kind of fraud will enable, like, the vitiation of the entire Constitution. And naturally, no, I'm not, like, saying that Trump phrased it perfectly. But this was taken to mean, oh, he, he thinks that because this happened, he should be able to overthrow the government. Well, that's not what he said. What he said was, if this kind of this kind of fraud, in fact, enables like massive violation of norms and, you know, essentially does hollow out the Constitution, if candidates work with the FBI and work with I mean, candidates aren't, I mean, I, I would suppose it's like a contribution in kind for Twitter to be working with a campaign, right? I mean, that's like a major camp, just a campaign finance violation, you know, least of all. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's really crazy. And, and the way in which people are saying, you are putting employee, former employees of Twitter in danger. And imagine working really hard at Twitter for years and then just having all your files and emails being released. This is so horrible. And they were just trying to protect a vulnerable addict and, you know, all this stuff. It's it's so sick and so crazy. You know, it really does indicate that we're kind of definitely in some kind of post-constitutional republic. I mean, I, I mean, this is like, like totally like third world stuff. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, about that, you know, there's, Trump is getting some hate, I guess, or, you know, concern trolling or I don't know, for whatever that truth that he posted. Is, is, am I speaking English still? Like, what is am I having a stroke uh, concerning uh, the uh, potential remedies to um, uh, the the election outcome and its causes? which may go outside the four corners of the Constitution. And, you know, a, a person might observe, as Seth has just observed, that there is strong evidence that we are currently far outside of the four corners of the Constitution. And, you know, I think that that what is happening with Twitter right now is revealing of that. And there seems to be some evidence that that Twitter's new leadership is conscious of the effect that they are having on the regime in taking this road. Which raises some interesting questions about how the regime intends to respond. It's uh, it's not like the old days where uh, you know you just like dispatch some goons and and try to solve your problems that way. I mean, when when you are not just the deep state but the state, and when you have a, a deep uh, and and rigorous uh, kind of control over the technological apparatus. Uh, you can strike back at at your enemies, your internal enemies, in many different ways. We already know that the uh, the White House, which is now who occupies the presidency, the White House, uh, the White House is now president. Uh, it has become sentient. Um, the White House is looking into uh, into Elon's, I don't know, dealings or doings. They're very vague about it, but they're 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 contemplating action if they're not taking it already. And this is this is a season for coups. It appears there's a a failed self coup in Peru going on right now. There is a uh, what appears to be a failed coup. I don't know how real it is. We'll maybe find out soon. Uh, in Germany, going on right now, there is a a sort of shadow world war going on right now, stretching through the Middle East and 
Eastern Europe and Asia and some other places as well. And, uh, and so the, uh, the question of, of how the regime is going to respond to what Elon is doing, the question of, of whether Twitter is becoming a place where cyborg democracy is, is being tried out, taken for a spin. I think that we're going to start getting answers. It's very hard to reverse the flow of events that is, uh, that has currently been unleashed. Uh, at home and abroad. And uh, those things are converging, as you can see, if you just take a look at the the latest issue of Time magazine, it will surprise no one to discover that a very, um, I doubt that an AI drew this, but it's, uh, it's a, a very lush portrait of, uh, of Zelensky on the cover of Time magazine. These, uh, all of these current things are, are fusing into one stream of content and, uh, and within that stream of content, we may see the emergence of a new regime form. Certainly, we've seen the U.S. regime mutate very fast and, uh, and very thoroughly away from what once was. It would be nice to restore constitutional government uh, in full, but that itself may take a while to do. And uh, it's shooting at a moving target, um, at, at least for now. So uh, how this is all going to impact the normies, I will once again invoke the normies. It's it's been hard to get normies to track these events. I think for all of the the practical reasons, this is not a, a dig at normies. They have busy lives too, and they have to keep their eye on the ball. But if there's one, you know, if there's one sort of uh, major effect uh, that Elon has had on all this, I think it really is kind of just like presenting things to the normies in a way that they can quickly and effectively make sense of, especially if they do actually spend any time on Twitter. And if the numbers are to be believed, Twitter usage is increasing, Twitter subscriptions or, or signups are increasing, very high, very high stake stuff going on. Um, and uh, if, uh, if Republicans want to have any say in what's going on, they had better bone up fast. Yeah, can we say that the Republican point is one I wanna make, and it's just over and over again when I watch Elon and look, uh, you know, let's make it, all the caveats, right? Okay, he's not really on our side. We don't know what side he's on. Best not to trust the richest man in the world. He might have his own interests at heart. You know, go figure. I don't need anyone to tell me that. Like, you know what, Matt? Actually, Elon isn't on your side. Because, like, yes, the richest man in the world may have his own, you know, ends or whatever. I tend to think these things aren't really as complicated when it comes to the people aspect. I think he knows a lot more than he says. And I do think that he is one of these guys who doesn't actually play very coy, I think. Uh, but, you know, I see the sinister uh, the sinister thing, and probably he hasn't really made his fork on the road, you know, yet. Uh, that could also be the case when it comes to which way he's going to go in terms of transhumanism, et cetera. But, but look, we know he's not on our side. But here's the thing. He is doing more over and over again in all the things James is talking about and more talking about ESG, talking about what's going on with, with the woke mind virus, uh, which is going to destroy civilization. And he's, I mean, he's taking our lines, guys. I mean, come on. I mean, is he reading the tweets or he just come up with it on his own? Is there some connection? Because I, I remember, uh, you know, talking with you guys and thinking myself whether or not we should use the word civilization. Like civilization is at stake. It sounds over the top. Elon is saying that all the time now. I mean, it's like every other day, like, well, our civilization is, you know, in question. Uh, and and when you look at his his rhetoric and the way in which he does it in a simple way, uh, the way in which he pops around with humor, uh, which is which is very Trumpy and very important, I think, in a if you're at that level of, of publicity. So he he keeps it for the normies like who he has. The branch is always open, very hard to pin him down and say he is a hardcore whatever because of the way he presents himself with humor. Uh, everything he's doing is a model for Republicans who, for the most part, are too crap scared to say any of the stuff he's saying. I mean, how many Republican politicians, right, have actually come out in the way he has about woke capital? It's actually not as many as you'd think. Uh, so 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 really, I mean, you know, whatever his end game is, whatever's going on here is good. It rips open the veil and. Uh, it, it's it's a model that I think should embolden Republicans. Now, of course, you can say, well, he's, you know, as the richest man in the world who is maybe going to make military Starlink and may, maybe has some leverage 
uh, over the feds, which obviously he does. Which is the only reason this is happening or able to happen. Okay, but but it's still like it's still rhetorically a model because even if you weren't, if he wasn't the richest man in the world, I think what he's doing is working. Like it's having an effect on people. It's emboldening people. And if you just look at it in terms of say rhetoric uh, or messaging, as we say today, uh, it's it's incredibly incredibly effective. And Republicans should take notice. Yeah, I mean, Matt. The speaking of vampires, the question whether we're inviting a vampire in with Musk is to me sort of irrelevant. Like, I I think I wrote this on the site of back when Musk was making noise about taking this stuff over. Is like you know you're always scrabbling together to a certain extent a coalition of allies, some of whom have you know maybe haven't even crossed the reached the crossroads where they would diverge. From you, but if they do, it's going to be real bad. Like you know, okay, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. There's obviously a huge amount of benefit here. Just as in 2016, a lot of people, myself, well, not not in 2016, but you know, during Trump's first term, I also was among those people who were like, yeah, there's problems with this guy, but like for now, this is the right, this is the right thing. And you know, to Seth, it's funny. I literally that is the first time I have ever heard anybody say about the truth that he he didn't actually mean let's suspend the constitution to put me back in office because the thing says that a fraud of this amount allows for the suspension of all rules so i've been sitting here staring at it trying to think if that's if i agree with that i at least think it's ambiguous i mean i still think this is probably i mean if it says what what it, everybody's interpreting it to say which i think is what it says then it's like you know a disaster of a, of a truth um but it's it's mainly a disaster with all as with all this you know, Trump stuff these days, it's mainly a disaster because it's such a, you know, a distraction and a self own. And certainly the things that you guys are saying about, well, we're already in this like messed up post constitutional situation is is definitely true. And if we were to read it to say like, you know, that the where we are, it's certainly possible to suspend the Constitution, like the evidence of that is plastered all over the Biden administration. Um, so yeah, this kind of like lets the press be like you you support ending the constitution rather than like you know why the hell is matt taibbi eating the lunch of every major news organization and being pilloried for it being attacked for saying things that are in fact not only true but urgently important so yeah i mean like uh, again <laughs> i i personally was horrified by that trump truth um but in large part i was horrified by it because it's like you know th this is by far the least important thing to be horrified and outraged over at this moment like there's there's just a, a constitutional disaster playing out in, in front of our eyes um as matt says like musk certainly demonstrates a greater understanding of what the shape of that disaster is um and a lot more smarts about how you might approach it than most republicans uh, which is kind of we we've come full circle the end of all our striving shall be to arrive again where we began uh by dumping on the republican party yeah and to get back um, to a an ancient sorry? ancient theme of the claremont institute too is yeah. uh, i mean w what it's been our argument our contention that in various ways fits and starts of course the last what has the last century been but a slow rolling slow motion suspense of the constitution where especially wherever the, they can get away with it so yeah mm -hmm. there's there <laughs> what's the line from the big lebowski more sh it's not that more sh has come to light it's that there are big <laughs> bigger forces uh, at work than uh, than trump's griping about 2020 uh right yes that that's kind of i mean no matter how bad it got it would still not come close okay that is all the time that we have so i will thank you all for listening to the roundtable. If you want to learn more about the Claremont Institute, you can visit our websites at claremont.org, claremontreviewofbooks.com, and our new, well, not that new anymore, but our uh, welcome DC-based Center for the American Way of Life at dc.claremont.org. You can check out Matt's organization, New Founding, by visiting newfounding.com to find out all of the excellent projects they're involved with that you can be involved with too if you want to help um, and you can donate to support our work at claremont.org slash donate don't forget if you haven't already to rate review share and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts five star reviews only please we assume that we've merited it in your eyes but if we haven't the best the least you could do is uh, keep your bad opinions to yourself all right folks that's it we will see you next week thanks to you all for listening